on his podcast, congratulations. And he's talking about his recent success. And it got me thinking. It got me thinking. Crystal, it got me thinking. Why is Crystal doing the Golden Hour podcast? Why is Crystal subjecting himself to the horrors that is Brendan Shaw? Why he sit, sat next to that CTE ridden, you know, drunk at 9 a.m. guy when he could be doing bigger and brighter things? Why? The reason why he's doing is obviously because he's still recovering from his allegations of whatever, diddling, whatever it may be. So clearly he's not in the best place to kind of, you know, call his own shots or to be back out there under the bright spotlights of Hollywood, enjoying himself at premieres and whatnot. He kind of has to sludge it with all the normal people. If what Chris Lee is saying is correct, it seems like his career is getting back to where it was prior, especially when it comes to stand up. So I'm thinking to myself, my prediction, what I said earlier, where I think Crystal Lear may be the first person to leave the Golden Hour podcast, may come true if this is if what he's saying is true. Asleep, and that is why you travel the day before because I would have missed both of my banging ass shows, and six thousand one hundred of you would have been sad as shit. And dude, let me tell you something, man. I put that one hundred in there, six thousand one hundred, because I tell people how many tickets I sell. Dude, I found out comedians be lying about their ticket sales. For real. That's crazy, dude. We're all very fortunate to do what we do for a living. There's no reason to lie about that. If this man is selling 6,100 tickets post kitty diddling, let's rewind that again. If this man is selling, no, if this man is moving 6,100 tickets post kitty diddling allegations, he's the truth. He legitimately is the truth, if that's the case. If he can do that post-cancellation with no big agency behind him, with no big network behind him, no Hollywood um, you know, power plays behind him, and essentially off the strength of his own podcast, his own network, that is powerful, bruv. That is powerful. He is legitimately like at the top of his game again he's, he's back where he was before don't get me wrong maybe the hollywood thing is done and dusted he may he may not he, he may never be in a in a marvel flipping movie or whatnot on a disney thing that's probably not going to happen anytime soon but in terms of going back to the top of stand-up he essentially is there already at the moment right if he decides to put out a special or to go on a seat or a nationwide tour he might sell out a majority of those venues it's legitimately legitimately crazy to see like to see this on a big level and it makes me think it makes me think how long will he put up with being on the golden hour how long will he put up with brendan repeating back his jokes how long would he put up with brendan putting his finger in his face and touching him which he clearly doesn't like he's one of those kind of you know every guy or every person has that you know friend in your social group who doesn't like a rough house who doesn't like touching, who doesn't like that kind of banter. It just annoys them. And he's that guy. He legitimately pains his soul when somebody tries to roughhouse him and push him around and touch him and shit. And Brendan clearly, because he's not the best that kind of articulate himself, whenever he feels like he doesn't have no, nothing funny to say, he starts doing the funny touch. Like, oh, see, that's a kind of like the Chad kind of like jock sort of thing, right? Putting on someone's trousers, sticking your finger in your ear. But Chris doesn't move with that whatsoever. So how much is somebody going to take? If I'm selling 6,000 tickets, there's no way that I'm sitting next to you and having you flipping, you know, lick your finger and stick it in my ear. That's not something I'm going to tolerate. Now, if I'm flipping Chappelle Lacey and I've got no career aspirate, or no, I'm, I'm at the beginning of my career, especially when he was co-hosting The Fire and the Kid and Brendan was sticking his finger in his mouth, maybe you have to take that because he's helping you book shows on the weekend. He's helping you pay your rent. He's helping you get on certain lineups. Even though I wouldn't do that, I would never sell myself that short. No, in a million years, especially what it looks like optically, this white man sticking his flipping finger down your face. But if you're Crystal and you're moving 6,000 tickets, you can't, in good conscience, willingly sit next to Brendan. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. If he does end up being the first person to leave the golden hour, it's going to be so painful. Because I feel like fear of all leaving King and the Sting was one thing. But I felt like King the Sting was already dead before Crystalina turned up and Eric turned up. I felt like the premise of the show already kind of was somewhat 
um, dead in the water because I felt like at some point Brendan didn't really like getting insulted too much. I felt like the premise of it was for him to get ripped and for them to have fans send in submissions so they could rip. It was a kind of like a roasting show. But I felt like after a while, Brendan got bored of being roasted or didn't like being roasted because he's so thin-skinned. And the premise of the show changed. It just turned into a podcast, essentially, where they just review, you know, topical topics and stuff and do some fan um, submission sort of stuff. But it wasn't necessarily the whole vibe of it. And then when Chris turned up, that was basically what the situation was. So when Theo left, even though it was heartbreaking for Brendan, I don't think it was bad as it kind of looked because the show was already dead obviously for the views it was terrible but the premise of the show is dead if crystalia leaves if crystalia leaves the golden hour that show is completely finished who do you replace crystalia with the show is done you're not going to get um josh wolf right to, to flip and replace crystalia it doesn't work like the reason why it works now is because chris and eric have really good comedic chemistry and whatnot they bounce off each other really well they they got good timing. They know how to roast each other, and obviously the common denominator is getting at Brendan as well. That kind of works. But if Chris leaves, that show might as well get cancelled, really, for the most part. And I think he probably will, especially if this guy is able to sell six thousand tickets post underage girl allegation stuff, because that is powerful. That's real mark. That for me, what it also proves to Chris is that either. His fans don't really care of the allegations. His fans are critical thinkers and were able to pass through the information themselves and think, you know what, even though it looks sus, because I think for the most part, if you really go down to the detail of the allegations, what people were alleging was that he was a terrible, uh, cheeky link, right? He didn't really have good manners. He kind of, you know, smashed them and dashed them. And, um, he also seemed to have a liking for girls who just turned over age, which isn't exactly diddling, is it? If you're into girls that are significantly younger than you, they're a particular age range. It's not exactly diddling, but it is weird. It is creepy. So maybe his fans were like, you know what? That's not necessarily that bad. Or maybe his fans just don't know. Because maybe he's he might be that big of a comic where the allegations didn't really go that far to them. It was just like, yeah, whatever. They didn't really hit as much as people think they did. I don't really know, but I just think it's really impressive, to be honest, that he's still able to command that level of tick because it, sh it shows that he's got that Louis C.K. type of fan base where they're going to ride for him regardless and they like what he does, especially you have to think also, I think I mentioned it previously somewhere where I was saying like, uh, you have to think also that he does, especially the podcast, he does it basically by himself, right? This podcast says congratulations. Um, similar to Bill Burr, it's not really guest heavy. It's just him ranting and raving into the mic, doing some funny bits here and there. And he still is able to command a pretty decent amount of people to watch it and to engage with it, right? 50 to 150,000, I guess, views all the time on his podcast. Decent amount of views, decent amount of endorsement. Like, he's doing pretty well for himself, all things considered. Like, no hate on the guy. You can't hate. It's legitimately impressive how he's been able to do it. Especially when you assume the allegations against him there was some merit to it. There's always been a history or kind of a law around him, always being a bit of a ladies' man in general. So it's not like he was completely innocent, right, of wanting, you know, to have his flipping winky-wink dipped and tiddled and stuff. Clearly, he's a man of the people when it comes to that sort of stuff. But clearly, as well, people love him in terms of that and able to kind of look past it. I don't know, man. I don't know. I just find that super impressive. And I also think, like I said before, that's definitely a mark for me that he for sure one million percent sure won't be on the flipping golden pony show any longer in my opinion i don't think so i don't think you could sell that amount of tickets and still be happy to sit next down to sit down to sit next to flipping uh brendan i don't think that works that way it really doesn't work that way i don't think so you only do that when you have no career prospects at the beginning which he clearly didn't but now if you're able to sell that that amount of tickets it doesn't make any sense why you sit next to him as you can see here the guy's booked and busy already, heading into the new year. Look at that. Every weekend, it looks like. Booked, 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 booked. Let's look at the first show in January. Let's see if there's got any tickets. How many tickets? Are, what, what does he sell his tickets for here? Because I think this is really impressive, bro, that he's still able to command this amount of attention flipping post-diddling accusations. This is quite impressive, right? Quite impressive. And also, maybe it's an indication that 
in general, cancel culture doesn't matter or care. No one gives a shit, especially if people think you're good enough and talented. You know, it is what it is. So let's, what's the main show? I guess the main show would be the, would it be 9.30? It would be 7. I say 9.30 because people don't want to have a drink, hang out, maybe go to the bar after or not. I don't know. Maybe it's, let's, let's just, just, let's do, let's do 9.30. Tickets are going between $56 to $195. Oh my God. Guys, look at this. An event on January 7th. We're at the 2nd of December today. And this auditorium, I'm not sure how many people it seats. Look at, look at the lack of tickets they have available here before this, this flipping thing goes down. The tickets available are only the blue dots. This is the only thing that's available right now. Wow. Wow. Look at that. 21 tickets available there. 15 available there. 22 there. All of those have been occupied for a date from the 1st, or was it 2nd of January? 7th of January. That is fucking impressive. Let's go for the 7pm listing. Oh, 7pm is completely sold out, I guess. Oh, no, that's 7pm. We'll look at 7pm. Okay, let's go for 9.30. Let's see what 9.30 is saying. Huh? That is incredibly impressive. Earth advisory. Okay, yes. What's this? entry requirements you must be over the age of 18 <laughs> <laughs> holy shit okay the the second time they've got more tickets available here 100 plus there 13 there 100 plus there but that's still an impressive amount that he sold already for a 7th of january date on those two dates fucking a in it jesus christ What's that Balboa Theatre in San Diego? I see what the, what the capacity is there. Balboa Theatre, San Diego capacity. <laughs> Come on. No, nah, this guy's the truth, mate. He might be the truth. He might be the truth. And I said before, when I say another part, I said before, I necessarily, I'm not really a fan of his stand-up. When I saw him at the Laugh Factory, I kind of got it. He's somebody for sure you see in person. He doesn't come across great on camera. I think his stand-up specials for the most part are pretty forgetful. There might be some good bits here and there, but they're not the greatest. But I think seeing him in person perform on stage, you kind of get it. But he's still way funnier on a podcast than he is on stage, in my opinion, still. I think a lot of those LA guys are unfortunately like that. But this 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 motherfucker is selling 1,000 or moving 1,400 tickets. There's no way he's going to be sitting next to flipping Brendan Shaw any longer, you know, inhaling his fucking tiger piss, flipping whiskey scent as he's sitting next to him, flipping, you know, bemoaning his life choices. It doesn't make any sense. So my prediction is, as per usual, <clears throat> bit of a bit of a hard prediction to put out there, but I'm going to say I don't think Chris lost until the summer when it comes to the... Uh, golden hour podcast i don't think it's happening the summer he's out that's my humble opinion i think the summer coming up he's out but again i could be wrong i could be wrong what we were saying in the chat um but uh da, 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 da. we're just gonna have a head of a time we can and then did they all leave you guys attack them okay people are, you, know, you guys are arguing about crystalia fair play no but i get it man it's a hard one to wrangle because i guess if you're somebody that's really ardently against diddling and stuff and you don't and you actually do see him as somebody that is a diddler it's hard to kind of wrangle that thing but the reality is man the people speak in it and if these fans are willing to separate themselves for their money to buy tickets to see your show clearly there's something there and i guess a lot of them because the spell you have to imagine as well that's the, that's the other bit that's a bit of a mind fuck with crystalia i feel like he's one of the only stand-up comedians especially within that la comedy scene who has a very female heavy fan base like he's got a lot of women fans and not only girls that want to fuck but like women in general seem to kind of gravitate towards crystalia so you'd imagine those women would be a little bit more sensitive to allegations of diddling especially when it involves teenage girls so if they're able to somehow pass through the noise and the information and come to some kind of you know conclusion that maybe he didn't do what he did might say a lot about them than him i'm not too sure but that's the bit that really puzzles and interests me in that regard he's got a lot of female fans they all saw the news you'd imagine so what happened because he went radio silent for like a year so clearly they were aware of what happened because they must have searched and wondered where they where their 
content creator was or where the comedian it was that they liked was and then maybe read up on some history about it and obviously the court documents are out there if you want to check it out blah 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 so the fact that they were able to put that to one side is very interesting and i guess my overall point of it is like i guess there is there's not really been a lot of i think because they all hang around each other you kind of think they're on the same level does that make sense you think they're on the same level in terms of how big they are but i guess when they comes to touring and ticket sales you see who the actual big dogs are in their circle even though some of them try and act like they're big dogs when it comes to selling actual tickets you see who the big dogs are and they're kind of the same names the Burt Crashers the Tom Segura's the Fear of Warns the Chris D'Elia's right these are the guys that actually are selling out places when they go on road and you don't really realize it because you feel like they're all on the same level when really you know Chris D'Elia probably sells two three four times more tickets than a Brendan Schaub does but Brendan Schaub the way he goes on you'd think he fucking you know sells a hundred thousand tickets every weekend that he goes out when he doesn't really and he plays in smaller places in bars and comedy clubs and whatnot he's not actually playing in fucking theaters every single weekend because he's not going to be able to fill them so clearly um that guy has got something about him that people like clearly 